I'm scared of the clock. I've got to finish in exactly 18 minutes. What's the problem? Just measure how long it takes and finish when you have to. But that's what I say to myself every Saturday morning when I go to my Zumba class. I need to leave at 9.15. Every week I seem to leave about five or ten minutes later than I have to. I get there before the class arrives, so I imagine I'm on time until one week. The teacher said, here's Grace, we can start now. And I realized I'm always late. They always wait for me. How embarrassing. I hate being late. Why is it so hard to be on time? So I decided to look it up. You can find anything on the internet. And I found a piece of research by a company called YouGov that said 20% of people are late for work at least once a week. So I'm not alone. But when I looked for a book on the subject, I was amazed. I found 60,000 books on time management, but they all seem to be written by people who had no problem with punctuality. The advice was, measure how long things take and leave home earlier. They didn't seem to understand my problem. I found 7,000 books on procrastination, but I couldn't find seven on lateness. What's the difference? Procrastination is about starting and lateness is about finishing. But there's more to it than that. Procrastination impacts your own life. It stops you doing what you want to do. Lateness impacts the lives of the people who wait for you. I did find one book. It was called Never Be Late Again, written by a psychologist who understood because she had the problem. She said lateness is a bit like overeating, but instead of eating one more chocolate, you just squeeze in one more task before you have to leave home. She divided late people into different categories, but when it came to explaining how to never be late again, it seemed to boil down to measure how long everything takes and leave home earlier. That's a bit like telling a, an overweight person to eat less. It's not that easy. So I decided to do my own research. It was fairly easy to find my subjects. They're the people who arrive just on time or a little bit late for events. And I discovered that we have a different attitude to time, a different experience of time. Every minute isn't the same length for us. We can speed up or slow down. In fact, we get deeply engrossed in what we're doing and lose all track of time. I call it time bending. We can vary the speed at which we work. We can do amazing things before a tight deadline. We actually enjoy the adrenaline buzz. It makes us feel alive. We love tight deadlines, but take away the deadline and we can slow right down and spend all morning watching TV in our pyjamas. But it's not all bad. We also have some positive characteristics as well as, as, well as being late. We don't mind taking on a task, even if time is short. And we, uh, we don't mind being interrupted, so we're flexible. We will drop what we're doing if you need our help, so we're responsive. And we don't mind too much if our plans get changed, so we're adaptable. But why are we late? I'd like to share with you the seven strange secrets in the subconscious mind of a time bender. Number one. We are hesitant to finish things. We, we don't like to close anything down until we really have to. We seem to get stuck in what we're doing and not want to move on. Number two, we don't like to be early. It's not logical, but any time vendor will tell you that we can aim to be on time, but not before time. 
We might have time in hand, we might think we can be early, but then just before we leave home, we squeeze in one more task. Just got time to empty the dishwasher. Number three, we're not good at measuring time. Because time will speed up and slow down for us, we're really not sure how long anything takes us. How long does it take to empty the dishwasher? Strange secret number four, deadlines are really important to us, but they must be real. We can't make a deadline up. We, if we pluck a deadline from the air, it doesn't give us the adrenaline buzz we need to get moving. Strange secret number five, we believe we can teleport from one task to another without any preparation time. If we lead, need to leave the house at eight o'clock, we actually think we can stop what we're doing at eight o'clock and instantly be ready to leave. Even if we live on the 10th floor, we somehow think we can just jump in our car and drive off. Number six, we are total optimists. We somehow think that the lights will always be green, the roads will be empty, and we'll find the perfect parking space. We don't leave enough time for things to go wrong on the journey. And number seven, and this may be the strangest secret of all, we do everything back to front. Stephen Covey, this famous time management guru, told the world that highly effective people start with the important and the urgent. Well, we turn this on its head. We start with the non-urgent and the unimportant, and we don't get round to the important stuff until that deadline clock is ticking, and then we can focus really well and get things done just in time. So how does this make me late for Zumba? I need to leave home at 9.15 for a 9.30 class. I get up at 7.30, have a shower, go and make tea, empty the dishwasher, water the plants, start looking at social media, get absorbed in emails, vaguely aware it's eight something. Then all of a sudden, oh no, it's nine. Quickly rush to pull on my sports gear, quickly do my face and my hair, and check the time. It's 9.15, I'm on time. Then I go and find my sports shoes, get a bottle of water from the fridge, put on my jacket, make sure I've got my phone, check I've got my keys, just locking the door, suddenly realize I've forgotten to have any breakfast, rush in time to grab a cereal bar and drive off, praying the lights will be green. But hang on a minute. I'm not always like this. My life isn't completely out of control. I can be on time when it matters. So I started to think about this and realized that I do have some control over my timekeeping. So I wrote a list and I called it my secret scale of acceptable lateness. And I realized that I can be early for a flight weddings and funerals, job interviews. I really should be early for school, college, work, client meetings. I'd really like to be on time for my exercise class, my choir rehearsal, my hairdressing appointments. I don't really need to be on time for meeting friends, family parties, and I can always be late for dinner parties and music gigs with a support band and cinema with adverts. So what's going on here? What's the pattern? Well, I saw that I can always be on time when there's a real external deadline with consequences. If I'm late for check-in, I don't get the flight. If I'm late for a job interview, I don't get the job but I can be late when there's no real deadline and no real consequences. I'm late for social occasions. I'm late for my family and my friends, and I had never realized this before. 
But the real light bulb moment was when I realized that means they see me as always late. I say I can be on time when it matters, and I'm late for the people who matter to me the most. So I started to think about the people who have to wait for me, because I have to admit, I don't spend much time thinking about them when I'm rushing through the lights trying to get there on time. And I realized that although they don't tell me what they think, they're too nice, they do tell each other what they think, and they do share their opinions on the internet. So I did learn a few home truths that way. But I also discovered that as well as time benders who can be late, at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who are really anxious about being early. They are so horrified at the idea of being late that they build in loads of extra time for their journey, and they can be 20 to 30 minutes early. Now, they hate lateness more than anybody, and they wait for us for longer than anyone else. So we drive them really mad. I call them the time keepers. Now, a timekeeper and a time bender are unlikely to be really good friends. But we all know opposites attract. So the chances are they'll end up as a couple. Now, I feel bad about this, and I'd like to do something to help. So on behalf of us time benders, I'd like to answer the question that you always have. How can you get a time bender to be on time? Because my book isn't just about what makes us late, it's also about how we can be on time. So, and I discovered that actually, the thing that you do to try and get us to be on time has the opposite effect. And you all know what it is. You lie about the start time. You tell us we've got to be there 10 minutes or even 30 minutes earlier than we really have to. Now, this will work the first time. It'll work the first few times. But once we realize what you're doing, we're going to stop believing you, believing you and we're going to start factoring this in. So in the long term, it'll make us later. What you have to do, and I really don't want to tell you this, you have to make that deadline real. If you say you're leaving at 8 o'clock and we're not ready, you have to leave. If you say dinner's at seven and we're not ready, you have to start. We're going to be very upset that you haven't waited for us. But next time, we'll take that deadline seriously. And as well as more ideas for partners, I've also got ways that we time benders can get ourselves to be on time. Because once we understand what makes us late, we can find ways to outwit our subconscious minds. So, for example, if we know we don't like being early, can we build in a pre-event activity? So if you're going to the theatre, can you meet your friends for a drink beforehand? Maybe you can offer somebody a lift. You might be a little bit late for them, but you won't miss the main event. We know we don't like finishing things. Well, perhaps we could put off going to bed by getting our clothes and our bag are ready for the next morning. We can't change our innate personality, but we can change our behavior. But before I finish, I'd like to just take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Because time management is a concept created over 100 years ago in the manufacturing belt of America, where efficiency and productivity were the keys to competitive advantage. When the world is predictable, efficiency is what you need. But for resilience, you need to be prepared for change. When the world is unpredictable, flexibility is what you need. When your customer's needs are changing, responsiveness is what you need. And when the future is not the same as the past, Adaptability is what you need. So maybe, a century later, it's time for a new look at lateness. Maybe the resilient companies, best place to face the future, are those where most of the employees 
are just a few minutes late for work. <laughs>